So I think uh, the idea of this course was to uh, take simple things and uh, try and uh, realize how to go ahead in these very, very simple matters which everybody faces every day. So we have Dr. Prateep first and uh, should we wait for five minutes? Presentation laga diya. So even before we start, I think we can ask Prateep a couple of, because what basically was he is trying to deal with is a case of normal tension glaucoma. <coughs> right, Prateep? Yeah. Intraocular pressure is low teens. So, so many of us are now facing this dilemma that should we treat it or should we not treat it? What is to be done about it? So, we'll have to see what he has to say. <coughs> Good morning, friends. Thank you, Dr. Harsh, for giving me this opportunity. So, Dr. Harsh has given me the topic. The IOP is in low teen, but disc and fields have glaucomatous damage. Treat or not? So, obviously, if you say that what he was telling, that it's a normal tension glaucoma, so if you say that it's a normal tension glaucoma, then obviously it's a pathology and any pathology has to be treated. But why he has asked me to tell about that not to treat? Because there might be some other condition which might mimic like a normal tension glaucoma, but may not be a normal tension glaucoma and there you may not have to treat these patients. Is forward not going forward, slides. Okay. So, the situation he has given to me is that the disc is a glaucomatous. Okay, Okay, so it's it's working all right now, it seems. Okay, so the situation is this. Uh, you can see that the disc is glaucomatous and there is a splinter hemorrhage, there is a RNFL defect and there is a visual field defect. So obviously if you have that kind of a patient, then you tend to treat. But sometime, you don't have to treat. So let us think that what all situation could lead to this kind of a condition where this looks like a glaucomatous, there is a correlating visual field changes. Obviously, as Dr. Hirsch said, that first is the normal tension glaucoma. Second, it could be an intermittent ankle closure, you know. Uh, when the patient comes to you, comes to you with a normal pressure, but repeatedly the pressure goes up because of the angle closure disease. But this intermittent angle closure disease might have damaged the disc. The third is patient may have a very thin cornea and patient comes to you, but erroneously you record a very low intraocular pressure. The third is, fourth is the fluctuation. The patient when he visited to you in the office, during the office hours IOP is low, that is because of the fluctuation, you are recording the trough IOP, that is a possibility. But there are some situations uh, which are also very important, like a steroid induced glaucoma. The child was treated at the young age with a steroid for vernal keratoconjunctivitis or for any other disease which require use of steroid. It may be use or abuse. And because of that, the patient had high pressure, damaged disc cupping, subsequently steroid was discontinued for a long time and patient visits to you after several years and you record the pressure, the pressure is normal but there is a disc damage and when you do the visual field, then visual field also shows the glaucomatous defect. It's not a very rare condition. Quite often we face this. There is an old trauma. 
the pressure is normal you do the gonioscopy there is a small angle recession but patient might have had a very high intraocular pressure for a prolonged duration because of the hyphema or trabeculitis induced because of trauma and then the pressure has become normal but it has at that time it has caused the disc damage then the pdas the pigmentary dispersion syndrome so quite often it is quite possible that pdas has caused high intraocular pressure but over a period of time all of us knows that it burnt out and the pressure becomes normal and once the pressure becomes normal then obviously the disc damage and the visual field damage remains recurrent uveitis particularly the fuchs and the ps the porchner sorsman syndrome where the patient have a recurrent episode of the uveitis related to the high intraocular pressure and this repeated episode of the uveitis may cause a high intraocular pressure and may cause a disc damage and the visual field damage and then there are certain neurological conditions and the vascular condition in the vascular condition particularly a very low blood pressure that leads to a poor diastolic perfusion pressure to the optic nerve and the retina there could be other condition as well the congenital optic disc anomalies the retinal pathologies and most important is the senile sclerotic disc you must learn to differentiate between the normal tension glaucoma and the senile sclerotic disc senile sclerotic disc looks pretty similar to normal tension glaucoma and on visual field you may get generalized reduction in the sensitivity but that patient does not have a glaucoma and that 80 year old gentleman should not be pumped with lots of anti glaucoma medication so this is a congenital anomaly it's a classical coloboma with related visual field defect sometime the the ophthalmologist may get confused with glaucoma but that is not and i have seen number of patients have undergone trabeculectomy as well this is a retinal condition where you know retinitis pigmentosa brvo crvo they may cause a kind of a glaucomatous defect and if there is a slight enlarged cupping then you may confuse and if you have not seen dilated fundus then obviously your diagnosis may be wrong aion you have to differentiate whether it's a disc pilar or it's a cupping and obviously the visual field defect also says that it's a neurological defect where it's it uh, you know respect the horizontal or the vertical meridians this is the another field where the patient had a pituitary adenoma and there was a bitemporal defect there is another kind of a disc anomaly you can see that is a tilted disc with inferior corner and if you see where carefully then you may feel that the inferior rim is lost and the pressure is normal then what would you do perimetry yes there is a related superior arcuate scotoma in both the eyes and if you do the oct there is a inferior temporal rnfl defect in both the eyes but believe me this patient was followed up for more than 10 years and it's stayed it's stable there is no progression so obviously it was a congenital defect so these patient either would not require any treatment just a follow up or require the treatment of the condition which they have if your patient has a normal tension glaucoma then what would you do the normal tension glaucoma disease study suggests that the pressure pressure has to be go down by around 30% from the baseline that is the objective if your patient has a pressure of 12 mm of mercury then the target should be 9 but the good thing with the normal tension glaucoma is that these patients are very slow progressor that is one important thing so obviously you know you have lots of breathing space and uh, you know there are other conditions as well which you have to keep in mind if the patient has a low tension or normal tension glaucoma you always look into whether the patient has a sleep apnea or not whether patient has a thin cornea that we have already discussed patient usually who have a migraine renaud's phenomena low nocturnal blood pressure as we have discussed they all have a tendency of development of a normal tension glaucoma and the new concept is that there is whenever there is a low cfs then these patients also tend to develop the normal tension glaucoma
People have suggested giving uh, extra salt if the patient has a low BP. I don't have any experience. I have not practiced it. But for low, not, uh, low CFS pressure, I do not know what treatment has to be given for these patients. So there are some other conditions as we have discussed that, you know, sometimes there is a physiological cupping and it is erroneously considered as a normal tension glaucoma. But as we have seen that you should do the vertical follow-up and if there is no further defect or there is a normal visual field and OCT, then you don't have to treat the patient. And if there is a coloboma and uh, obviously there is optic norpit, then these patients uh, uh, would not require any treatment, just observation. I was discussing about the burnt out uh, uh, PDS. So how would you recognize the burnt out PDS? Usually in the PDS, the excessive pigmentation will be at the inferior quadrant. But when it is burnt out, all the inferior quadrant pigmentation or uh, the pigmentation at the inferior angle is angled by the phagocytes and only the superior pigmentation is more prominently visible. So that is the burnt out uh, glaucoma and you have to look for the angle recession as well. This is a quite uh, uh, clearly visible is a PDS. So these are all the condition which you should look for and uh, don't treat those conditions where the other form of treatment or other investigations are required. So first investigate and then initiate the treatment as per the need. So normal tension glaucoma, you have to look into whether the patient really has a normal tension glaucoma or it is associated with some other condition and because of that the patient has developed it. If it is a true normal tension glaucoma, then the prostaglandin analog is the first choice of drug. The alpha-2 agonist and the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor just yes, uh, suggested to be a vasoprotector and a neuroprotector, but we do not have a good uh, scientific evidence where we can use this drug to primarily treat the uh, normal tension glaucoma. So even today, for me, the best drug of choice is the prostaglandin analog. And if required, then I would like to add the alpha-2 agonist or the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. And as far as the follow-up is concerned, the follow-up is same as like a primary open angle glaucoma. So, Prateek, thank you very much for uh, your no, 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 not thank you. You still stay here <laughs> <laughs> because you have to clarify for us that a patient came and uh, he has got, like you very rightly, Dr. Prati pointed out all those cases of burnt out glaucoma. Now, let me tell you that there is an advanced damage. Okay? Now, uh, so now, how do I add that point of time decide? Because I cannot be 100% sure whether it was a burnt out glaucoma or not. So, how do I add that point of time decide? Because I cannot be 100% sure whether it was a burnt out case or it is not a burnt out case. So, how do I decide whether to treat it as a burnt out case or it is not a burnt out case? So, how do I decide whether to treat it or leave it? Because since it is an advanced damage, am I okay in leaving it, let us say at 14 pressure and following it up? to see how the fields are going or would you rather take a risk and treat it? You know, it's always a big dilemma whether to treat these patients or not to treat these patients. But uh, simply most of the glaucoma expert who have seen the patients going <laughs> blind, if you see a patient only a temporal island of uh, visual field is left, then obviously you would like to treat this patient. Because there is nothing harm in putting the patient on a treatment and do the follow up. Uh, patient also would not mind putting up the one drop every day that is a prostaglandin analog. And over a period of time, if you feel that the, the patient is progressing, then obviously you must consider. Uh, aggressive lowering of IOP even if the pressure is in single digit and then the trabeculectomy uh, is indicated for these patients for aggressive lowering of IOP. But advanced defect with the normal pressure and you feel that patient may not have a normal tension glaucoma, it might be related to some other condition but they still don't take a chance and treat the patient, give a benefit of doubt to the patient. Thank you, Pratip. I think that was a very important message. This crux of this talk was, yehi hum log message aap logo ko dena chate te ke whether actually should we treat these people. The question is, we don't have a choice. You know, we may, if there was a choice, if the defect was not that advanced, we may just hold back and see whether the fields are advancing and then decide that. But like rightly he pointed out that giving one drop 
may not be uh, bad enough and the patient would definitely be scared and if he goes somewhere else, somebody else will start medication definitely. So it is better that you keep things under control and so if there's an advanced damage, you have ruled out the first thing like he rightly pointed out, all those cases you have to rule out what it is. If it is something else, which is something specific you can find out, fair enough. If you cannot find out anything specific, it is probably safer to treat until you are sure which way you are headed. Thank you so much, Prateep. Thank you. <coughs> we now have Sagarika, Dr. Major General Sagarika Patiyal. Okay, na, madam? Sagarika. Army people can never say anything wrong. Okay, Sagarika? Oh, you can say Sagarika. So, I so know, I always... Very fine glaucoma surgeons and a clinician. Uh, she will... So, now Prateep had told you about an advanced glaucoma and uh, normal pressures. On the other hand, now Sagrika has to tell us very clearly whether I should treat a patient with maybe 24, 26, 28 pressures, but the field is normal, the disc is normal. So let us, we will not let Sagrika leave unless he clarifies us for us what is happening here. Thank you, Dr. Harsh. And since I always overshoot my time, I'm going to go straight into the talk. So he's already told, how do I... How do I do it? So, first of all, we have to define, uh, okay, now, we have to define a particular thing and that is what is ocular hypertension. Now, this is defined as consistently, the word is consistent, elevated intraocular pressure more than 21, he is fortunately given 24, two standard deviations above the mean population intraocular pressure, again, by GAT, not by NCT or by any other means, on two or more occasions, in one or both eyes, in the absence of any clinical evidence of optic nerve damage, field defect or any other pathology, mind you, any other pathology that would explain the high intraocular pressure. So, most important, do a clinical examination. Why is it so important to study optic uh, ocular hypertension because it has been shown to be the most important risk factor for the development of primary open ankle glaucoma. So we don't have glaucoma still but we merely have ocular hypertension but it may result in glaucoma. And there's a huge amount of debate. Should we rename it? Should it be glaucoma suspect? Should we treat it? Should we not? What are the side effects? Should we treat with low, uh, IOP lowering drugs? Should we do, do surgery for it? Etc. Etc. Should we wait for glaucomatous damage to take place? Yes or no? What does the house say? Would you like to wait for glaucomatous damage? Raise your hands. None. Good. And therefore, or visual loss if it is not treated. So, therefore, the debate continues. Now, ocular hypertension study has beautifully answered these questions. They have told us who are the guys who are maybe at a greater risk of developing glaucoma. So, they have told us the predictive factors for development of individuals with ocular hypertension. And this is the first study to document that if you have a thinner cornea, which Dr. Pratik talked, us about, uh, talked to us about, this is predicts the development of POAG. So a CCT is a must for every patient. Suppose you combine all these factors, then you can identify patients who are at moderate to high risk for developing POAG and who are more likely to benefit from early treatment. Oates study suggests Treatment is a must for patients whose pressure is higher than 24 millimeter of mercury among those who have greater than 2% annual risk of developing glaucoma. This is cost effective. I cannot but forget what Dr. Harsh had once upon a time talked about that he had a patient who had ocular hypertension. He said, theke, theke, tum chale jau, koi baat nahi. And that guy came back later with glaucoma. I will never forget it. So as a result, whenever I see ocular hypertension, I think about what he had said because he has huge experience. What the medications that were used in the uh, ocular hypertension study were beta adrenergic antagonists, topical carbonic anhydrase, PG analogs, alpha adrenergic Agonists. Now, various risk factors have been seen, both in India as well as by the EPGS, and they have found that practically all the risk factors are same, whether it is older age, higher intraocular pressure, a greater vertical or horizontal cup disc ratio, greater uh, uh, pattern standard deviation on a standard automated perimetry, a thinner CCT, 
other risk factors like age, race, positive family history, low diastolic perfusion pressure, which Dr. Pratik has again talked about. And don't let's forget what we found in India. In the Chennai study, they found a higher incidence in the rural, rural cohort as compared to the urban cohort. And we have to do diagnosis and follow up of these ocular hypertension patients by doing a very important study and that is your perimetry, standard automated perimetry and ophthalmic examination of the optic disc by a dilated examination. These are the gold standards. You have to follow up the patient like that and detect the patient whether the patient has glaucoma or not. You can also do earlier detection by other means like swap, FTT, SLO, etc. But whether or not these are really going to give you correct results, we still really don't know. Another test which I've never used, but I found it, and so okay, why not tell everyone and maybe check, it, check out on it, that is the ibopamine test has been reported to be an efficient, provocative test in the management of glaucoma in patient test risk. I really don't know. If anyone has any idea, please do let me know. There's a risk calculator also, which I remember many years ago was given to us, but unfortunately, we never used it. Maybe you all have seen it also. I'm going to go to a patient, 53-year-old male. He had no comorbidities, no family history, no steroid use, found to have pressures of 36 and 37 in 2009, so many years ago. Now this man came back in 2018. His anti segments were normal. He had open, uh, grade 3 open angles. His diurnal variation varied between 18 and 20 in the right eye and 18 and 20 in the left eye. Absolutely normal. And mind you, these are all office diurnals. CCT was practically normal. He was in the right eye on two drugs and rather three drugs, Zalacom and Dorsox in the left eye and on Zalacom. Now, this was his field in 2018. And this was his optic nerve. Very healthy. You can make it out. Even the retinal nerve fiber layers you can see. What about his OCT? I always like to do a baseline OCT. Gives me a lot more confidence that, okay, nothing is really wrong. Like, for example, Dr. Hush saw my OCT and said, all green, Sagrika, fine, fair enough, no problem. So I do the same thing. But the thing is that you have to, when you see these patients, ask yourself some questions. What are they? What if this guy develops ocular surface problems when I'm giving so many drugs? What, are the, what about the other side effects of AGMs? Remember, there are so many systemic side effects of AGMs which you cannot afford to forget. Should I really have treated this patient? Because there's a high prevalence of optic uh, ocular hypertension. We know that. But a low conversion rate to POAG. Could we really have kept this patient on follow-up? Should the number of AGMs be reduced? What about the cost of treatment? Patient has to go and spend about maybe five, six hundred or more than that every month on buying medicines. How long should we keep treating? Lifelong? I don't know. What should our target intraocular pressure be? We base our target intraocular pressure by looking at our field. We have no field defects at all. Should we contemplate surgery if the patient has got, let's say, a newly diagnosed uh, hypertension? IOP is also uncontrolled. Now, in newly diagnosed ocular hypertension and POG patients, it may be a first viable option in those with poor compliance and who are intolerant. Mind you, lots of patients are intolerant. We have to recognize that intolerance and not give for, let's say, primary toxicity, lots of steroid ointments. No, no, please don't do that. What about cataract surgery for IOP control and OHT? Good treatment for usually significant cataract. What do you say, Dr. Hirsch? Don't you agree with me? Yeah. So yes. now there's another treatment which has come yeah, up, and that is the that. National Institute of Health. And it's, the huge study was done, the LIGHT study, and they found that SLT is a very cost-effective alternative to ocular hypotensive drops. Very, very good. We may be, having, we may be able to apply that also. Now we're going to another, another patient. In 2006, this officer came to me. He was a 46-year-old male, that time lieutenant colonel. They call me lieutenant colonel now also in the IOS. Doesn't matter. He was a glaucoma suspect with 0.6 percent well, is to one in each eye normal fields pressures normal strong family history father had glaucoma vision normal gonioscopy open angles devil was practically normal little bit of high raised pressure of like maybe 22 24 and he had little thick cornea look at it 582 584 583 in 2006 feels normal kept on follow-up no treatment okay in 2012 in the army we keep traveling from place to place some of us are not very very uh, familiar with fields. So this guy was probably not too familiar with the fields. And so he saw this defect, which is right in the center. He said, okay, glaucoma. And so he started treating the patient with medicines. And so then started this man on medicines. That's what happens all over India. It's not just the poor army guy. Okay. In 2016, once again, that guy was now on just one drug. To, uh, no field defects seen in both eyes. We went down to 2019. No field defects. 
The guy was now on plenty of medication. I'll come to that. 2022, the guy came back to me. I'd seen him first in 2006, and now I find absolutely within normal limits. So the ophthalmologist stained the medicines first from Timilol, which he was on, and then that became Travacom. And why? The pressures were 19 and 17. I don't know. Maybe he measured the pressure on NCT, found it, doesn't matter. Then in 2013, another drug was added, Dorzox T to Travitan. So Travitan, Dorzox T, fair enough. Then OCTs were being done annually, normal, but this guy developed PEDs in 2014. So now comes the VR surgeon into the picture. In 2018, in RPC, his vision, the DV was 17 to 18. Fields were absolutely normal, fundus at 0.6, but now look at the optic disc. Now, mind you, this has been seen in RPC. Optic cup changed from 0.6 to 0.8, documented. And he had superior neurodental rim thinning. Now, because of the PEDs and because the guy had to be given um, injection Lucentis, so the drugs had to be changed. Mm -hmm. So you have to examine the patient, check back what is happening to that guy in some other portions of the eye. And so the drug was changed from, uh, they changed it from the um, uh, prostaglandin analogs to do Dorzox T and Alphagan, Alphagan P. In 2022, we find his vision is very good absolutely normal, excepting for a little bit of changes which are taking place in the retina. IOP is within normal limits, fields are normal, and, med and he, of course, he's on those medications. So what are the lessons we are learning? Please counsel every patient. Very important fo follow-up. Just can you remove that little thing of me, please? Oh, oh. Sorry, friends. Change AGMs only when required, depending upon the dynal control or development of other diseases. Our glaucoma patients are going to continue, and mind you, the retina is going to be affected by God knows what all. If they have diabetes, diabetes is going to happen. So many things are going to happen. So therefore, you have to keep on and on alternating. We have got to see what will suit the patient or not. Be prepared for the unseen. The pressure and optic nerve head changes. You have to keep consider options for treatment. And therefore, I, I think, rest my case, Therefore, I would like to treat because patients keep on moving from place to place. You cannot, one person cannot observe the patient for so long. Therefore, it's better to treat because then you safeguard the patient. Of course, this is always a debate. I stand my case. Thank you. Thank you, Sagarika. Thank you very much uh, for finishing well in time and with so much enthusiasm. I was really, your enthusiasm is infectious. <laughs> so... Uh, so basically what the crux of the matter is that you get a patient with normal visual fields, normal disc, and let us say normal OCT. And if the pressures are below 24, 25, if there is no family history of glaucoma, I think one may still, and if you, you talk to the patient that, okay, you can later get glaucoma, but, and please, what Sagrega was uh, telling was, that this patient had 624 ka corneal thickness. So, we had studied that if the cornea is thick, we had minus it, we had minus it, it was 24 ka ban gaya, 18. We had said, very good, perfect. And that patient I left, and one year later, he came back to me, luckily only with a wedge defect. And there was only very early OCT changes. So, the question is, do not get misled by a thick CCT. Do not get misled. Okay? So all these patients have to be very, very regularly followed. But again, like she said, medication itself is an issue. So you have to discuss with the patient. And believe me, every doctor that I have treated, he wants treatment. He doesn't want to get observed. But lots of patients as such would say, okay, sir, I don't want any medication. I will regularly come to you every three months, every six months. That's fine. So... If a patient is having any pressure above 27, 28, irrespective of anything else, straight away has to be started on treatment, field normal, disc normal, OCT normal, finish. Matter ends there. If it is around 24 to 26, then you will see, is there a positive family history? And the positive family history doesn't mean, Arey, wo dada ko shayad hua tha, pata not that. We want papers. When you see the papers, then you realize whether actually it was just nothing. So many times it was nothing and they are correlating it with something else. So don't go on that. So you have to be sure that if there are some other changes, 
if there are some intermittent pressure so you need a diurnal variation to know what exactly is the highest pressure this is one of the most important indications of doing a full diurnal variation so that you know that the highest pressure is rising to this much if it is rising above 27 28 even if everything else is we will start one medication definitely if it is not we will just follow up and uh, make sure that he is following up if you know that he may not follow up then like sagrika said put on treatment safer there thank you very much sagrika you can run for that and we now have another very very interesting topic uh, i whenever i used to go to international conference mai ek hi cheez attend karna chahta tha ki yaar ye myopia aur glaucoma mein koi farak bata de so i was never actually able to get a good this thing so today i think sunita will clarify for us that it is a patient of myopia is he actually suffering from glaucoma or not uh, uh, thank you dr harsh uh, for giving me this opportunity so i'll be talking about difficulties in diagnosis and management of glaucoma in uh, myopic eyes so we are all aware of the association with myopia and glaucoma while the two conditions can coexist there is often a diagnostic challenge and why myopic discs are more predisposed uh, to glaucoma because there is stretching and thinning of the lamina cribrosa uh, which is a primary site of damage which leads to decreased distance between the retrobulbar csf space and the iop compartment resulting in the steeper patient gradient uh, pressure gradient across the lamina cribrosa causing more predisposition to glaucomatous optic neuropathy so these patients are more predisposed and uh, why it is difficult to detect glaucoma in myopic eyes because glaucoma is assessed clinically as we have discussed uh, with by optic nerve head evaluation and visual fields and there is uneven expansion of the posterior globe wall which leads to tilting of the disc and parapapillary changes and thereby making the disc evaluation more challenging also there are degenerative changes in the retina in myopia which could lead to visual field defects that can mimic those seen in glaucoma also progression is difficult to detect because the myopia will also progress and with progressive tilting of disc it leads to de uh, difficulty in detection whether the progression is because of myopia or because of glaucoma intraocular measurement uh, pressure measurement is also are uh, not accurate because of the thinning of sclera and cornea which will alter corneal hysteresis so the evaluation of glaucoma in myopia requires a multimodal approach so the morphological diversity of myop optic nerve head uh, in myopia includes tilting and cyclotorsion myopic conus parapapillary atrophy and these discs are often very large with large discs uh, and cups and thereby mimicking glaucoma also nrr may not be interpreted correctly because of the shallow cupping and tilted disc so nrr may look pale so tilted disc are very very prevalent very common in myopic eyes almost 40 to 60 70% as compared to the normal population and when you see the disc like this which is uh, more or less like a d shaped optic nerve uh, and you should Uh, we seeing these discs uh, in a stereoscopic manner wherein one half of the disc will look elevated and the contralateral half depressed torsion which is the rotation of the sagittal axis of the optic nerve more than 15 degrees is again very common and sometimes you get to see this disc which are 180 degree torted so you need to identify these morphological variability parapapillary chororetinal atrophy we know the alpha zone and beta zone um beta zone where there is loss of rp so beta zone and alpha zone may be uh, common uh, in myopia and beta zone is more common in glaucoma but now with the advancement in uh, hd uh, in uh, oct uh, with the spectral source oct we are now able to diagnose uh, or detect the other zones the gamma zone which is the zone between optic nerve head margin and brooks membrane termination and you just see this scleral flange here which is present and uh, there is no vascularization uh, within 15 microns and this is called the delta zone so this is a normal uh, disc and this is the glaucomatous disc disc with the meta zone and this is the myopic disc as you can see large uh, disc with uh, 
large large disc with no cupping shallow cupping and myopic corners and uh, this uh, delta and uh, zone so you have to identify these morphological variations as far as visual field analysis is concerned uh, the myopic retinopathy would lead to visual field defects which cause obscuration of the glaucomatous defect however one should remember that the defects due to myopia may affect area around the blind spot so the defects will not start uh, at the uh, nasal step or the gerum's area as they would in glaucomatous case in a typical glaucomatous case so that is a differentiating point and progressive visual field loss despite stable macula may indicate glaucomatous progression so if your myopia is not progressing but the these defects are progressing then probably it could be because of my uh, glaucoma so oct in myopia i think one should not do oct and one should not depend on oct especially if the myopia is high it could be fallacious and one re reason is that the volume scans which are required with most of the octs have a depth focus of about 2 mm and there's increased curvature of the posterior wall and increased axial length of these highly myopic eyes which exceeds this limit leading to segmentation error so you won't be able to acquire the uh, the entire image in one plane uh, that is the reason there are segmentation errors and there is also no normative data base available for myopic population so there is no age age matched comparisons so segmentation errors i think you should be able to uh, understand the oct of a myopic eye and don't get carried away by these red uh, defects here and uh, in myopia there is temporal shift of the blood vessels and temporal displacement of the rnfl bundle because of the scleral elongation so as you can see here uh, this will cause false thinning of the nasal rnfl and false thickening of the temporal rnfl so if there are no myopic changes at the macula then gc ipl or macular thickness parameters would be more accurate so i think this is very important because most of the patients um, uh, are treated on the basis of oct nowadays um, red disease can also be caused by these temporally shifted bundles as you can see these bundles are shifted temporally here causing red disease actually the patient doesn't have glaucoma so i would take you to a few cases now so this is a, a patient uh, who was myopic with high axial length normal iop you can see tilted and torted discs and oct showing segmentation errors and um, and uh, a red disease uh, however the visual fields are more or less normal so i think you have to depend on visual fields uh, in such cases another patient again he was diagnosed as poag somewhere else he had advanced cupping and he was on pg analog and you see the status of retina here you can't even identify the neuroretinal rim there's such an extensive parapapillary atrophy here involving uh, macula and uh, oct is a strict no no don't ever treat uh, your patient on based on oct and if you carefully look at the fields you can see this both the changes are present uh, because of the myopia you see this enlargement of the blind spot uh, here around the blind spot there is uh, there are scotomas and there is nasal step also and over a period of time this nasal step and the superior arcuate scotoma is uh progressing so that is suggestive of progression of glaucoma so you have to be very very meticulous this is another patient uh, and you see this horizontally oval discs with uh, the uh, uh, crescent inferiorly uh, in both the eyes so again these are the fields so you have to correlate your clinical findings and again and again i would emphasize that oct is not useful so uh, clinically iop is not always elevated in myopic patients as we heard about normal tension glaucoma so look for iop fluctuations to rule out normal tension glaucoma cct should be checked to identify falsely low iop measurement also a history of refractive surgery you need to elicit the history of refractive surgery because some of these patients may have undergone refractive surgeries and you may get false iop reading careful evaluation of optic disc and be aware of fallacious oct findings glaucoma may progress quickly due to uh, lamina cribrosa thinning so regular follow up is very essential and you have to correlate everything and one thing about oct if you have to perform oct then don't rely on color coding instead compare the patient's own oct uh, uh, in follow up also and if there is any progression then uh, uh, or minuous change 
uh, suggestive of progression, then you can consider treating the patient. And if no myopic maculopathy is present, then uh, you can uh, consider doing macular uh, OCT. Early management of these patients are very important because uh, uh, the surgical management is difficult because of the altered scleral biomechanics when compared to normal population and be cautious about doing glaucoma surgery and this is the only situation when the scleral rigidity is low that you do not use uh, mitomycin C for a long, long time and higher concentration because it can lead to disastrous consequences so judicious use of mitomycin C is warranted so there are no hard and fast rules for diagnosis of these difficult cases treat each patient individually do a care careful examination taking in everything into consideration the risk factors the optic nerve visual field IOP and CCT and it is reasonable to err on the side of caution and one thing which is very important to know is that every glaucomatous eye you need to consider as uh, every myopic eye should be considered as glaucomatous unless proven otherwise. So if there is slightest suspicion, please err on the side of treatment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunita. I think perfect finish. And the last slide was very, very important. I Sorry, I forgot to introduce Sunita. She is uh, the head of Department of Glaucoma in Shroff Charitable Eye Hospital. But her she is a wonderful, wonderful surgeon. And uh, with Shushmita sitting somewhere here, she is one of the few people who have really gone into the uh, angle and done the first trabectome, kahok and what not. So uh, very nicely explained. Sunita, I think the last part was very, very relevant because uh, you are always confused. Is it myopia? Is it glaucoma? Should I treat? Should I not treat? So like she has rightly said, better err on the side of being defensive and you can always follow up these patients. Each patient is an individual. So you will check the pressures. More important is to check the pressure because many times, like she said, OCT ka kuch nahi pata lagega. OCT is useless. Fields, sometimes there will be so many changes here and there, you are not sure what is happening over there. So family history, what is happening to the pressure over the time, they may be the clue to what you are going to do in this case. But better again, like we said in NTG, like we said in ocular hypertension, better treat rather than being sorry. Thank you so much, Sunita. And we now have your own very Mumbaikar, Dr. Shanti Lal Shah, Manish Shanti Lal Shah. He's gone. <laughs> so he is going to resolve for me the issue that uh, should what exactly is the maximum medical therapy, and should when should I push and how much should I push a patient for undergoing surgery? Because frankly speaking. Uh, these things vary a lot. When I was younger, I was not sure of my surgery. I would give them 10 things that, oh, there's 2% chance, the vision may go, this, that, and the patient will run away. <laughs> but then gradually what I saw was that many of these patients came back blind. So then you realize that you really do not have many options, but let us listen to what Manish has to say with his vast experience in surgery. Thank you, Harsh, and good afternoon, everybody. And maximal medical therapy, we have gone to the other extreme. We started discussing whether to treat, not to treat, initiate to treat. Now, these are patients who are essentially requiring a lot of treatment. They are on multi-drug therapy, and it is, as Harsh pointed out, a point which is always confusing what we are supposed to do. This is not going ahead. Oh, dekho, yaar, there a slide, dekho. Manish, my cooper color. Yes. Okay. So, yes, yeah. So, basically, we are going to give drugs to reduce pressure. And how much drugs and how many drugs, how many drops should we put? Maximal medical therapy, what I understand, is which patient can tolerate, comply, and adhere. So, it is different for each person. It is not going to be a fixed formula. If you are expecting me to give you a fixed formula of how many drugs to give, that's not going to happen. I will give you a formula in the end, but that is not going to be about how many drugs. Customization is the key. So does that mean you do what you please? You know, very often when we say customize means whatever I want, I can do. It's not exactly like that. We have to be objective because here we are dealing with a disease which can cause blindness. It can cause blindness on treatment. 
it can cause blindness when you operate because of the complications so it is not a easy tight rope to walk but we have to be practical so put yourself into the shoes of the patient and see how you can put drops in my experience even after putting so much fear of blindness most of the patients after they have understood what is glaucoma live in fear that they will go blind one fine day but still there is a limit to how many drops and how you can adhere to a complicated schedule so in my opinion four to five drops a day maybe in two or three bottles seems to be a practical upper limit of course if you can get away with a single drop and a single bottle that's fantastic but that's not the subset of patients we are discussing here most commonly we have patients who are on brinzolamide bramonidine combination with a prostaglandin analog which can be in a fixed drug combination with a timolol so here you are having four drugs in two bottles and the patient needs to put it around three times or four times a day drops so this is very practical many patients can adhere to this and there are other combinations like the combination with the topical carbonic anhydride inhibitors with timolol brimonidine with timolol along with prostaglandin analogs and nowadays before the patient is really taken up for surgery we have the option of adding the new drug which is the rock inhibitor fortunately we can get a rock inhibitor put only once a day and there is a place for the timolol pilocarpine combination which is not available today in india but i hope it will come back in select situations especially in pseudo fake so these drugs we combine and try to give a combination which works and the patient can tolerate there is personal variability some patients in extreme situations where they are living one eye is already lost this is the only seeing eye and they are living in fear of blindness because they have lost the first eye due to a complication of surgery these there are significant number of patients whom i have followed up for a long time and they are ready to put these drops in the schedule that you are giving them for a long time so what is the cornerstone of your approach to these patients who are putting many drops the first thing you have to keep in mind is what i called tca and this has to be evaluated by the treating physician the tolerance how much of local and systemic side effects which are bearable or not bearable you have to make out what is going on so most of the patients will complain some things the patients don't complain and you have to actively go out and look for compliance is putting the drops at the right time in the dose that you have prescribed so they are putting it in the right way and adherence is able to following your schedule for long number of years so that it make it a part of their life so you have to evaluate the patient from all these three which i call tca for short so each patient is evaluated the tolerance part is you see the patient's complaints on the drugs evaluate specially for the red eye and the dry eye status and the lid pigment again i would like to stress patients may not complain but you have to look at it compliance is a general inquiry and i would share one formula which i have i generally ask the patients are you putting drops they say yes and then i tell them oh you put the zalatan twice a day no and you put this timolol once a day and confuse them so then they come out with what they are doing and that is a nice way of finding out whether they are following your schedule or they are actually confusing everything so it's an art and the adherence part whether the patient is likely or able to continue your regime for a prolonged period is again a subjective thing which you have to evaluate based on what you saw in the first tca evaluation so each patient is assigned an arbitrary grade in my clinic whether the tca is good okay or poor so if i see a patient who is having too many complaints has a red eye and when i ask him leading questions about the schedule of drops and he tells me yeah, this one i put in the morning oh sorry sorry this one i put in the morning and he is not sure that means he is if he is not sure means he is definitely not putting the drops as you have asked him to put this plays a very important role and i grade them into good okay or poor i'll come to this again then of course you proceed with the routine evaluation of the patient based on your visual fields optic disc iop side effects compliance adherence and general health and i think we have had some discussion on all that a little time before the next important point i would like to evaluate is the visual function 
So what is a patient who has a good visual function? The visual field defects are moderate. Mean de deviation would be between 12 and 18. Obviously, you don't usually have patients with early visual field defects on maximal medical therapy. It is not very common. So I have not included that, but you can include. And no involvement of the fixation. And over time, more or less, it is stable. This I would classify as good status visual function. Moderate visual function where the visual field score is moderate or severe, but 10-2 central fields do not involve the absolute fixation. The points which are defective are at least 4 degrees away, that is 2 points on the 10-2. And stable on progression, these I would classify as moderate visual field function. And the next and the last are the poor visual field status patients who have a severe visual field defects with mean deviations more than 18, 20 or more 25 with fixation involved and any of which is showing progression. So even if the visual field function is moderate but shows progressions in three consecutive fields, it is graded as a poor visual field function patient. So this is a kind of patient you see sometimes. It is an advanced defect and over time there is progression. As compared to this is a patient who over time is not showing much progression. Then you come to the next point that is what is the pressure levels? You are following the target pressure concept where you have evaluated and decided that my patient would be likely to remain good or stable at a certain target pressure based on the intraocular pressure visual field status, age and other risk factors. So then you are going to check the patients. So you classify again into good, okay and poor. The patients who have are maintaining target pressures less than target for more than 75% of your visits. Now you are going to do many visits, you are going to check pressure at each visit and you are going to see whether it is in your target range. The others are the okay, those where the target pressure is there only 75 or 60 percent and it's about target the other times and those whose target pressures are not even near the tar target levels for 50 percent of visits are poor control or poor IOP control patients. So then you are going to evaluate the life expectancy of the patient and this is one question which came to me personally many times always we discuss target pressure based on life expectancy and how do we know the life expectancy of an ex-patient. So I have gone online and done some research and there are online calculators based uh, and the mutual funds seem to be <laughs> ahead of us. They have given us a formula. So NM mutual fund which doesn't exist in India has got a very nice age expectancy formula where you put in all the details and you can get an age expectancy. So I just put it here because I think that there must be many people like me who don't know the answer to this question. How do we work out the age expectancy of a patient? But there is a scientific method to do that also. And specific cardiovascular history and history of malignancy in last five years is a very important marker about the life expectancy of the patient. So when you are thinking about what to do the, to the patient, you have to have a rough idea what to expect, how long he is going to live. And the last and most important is the patient education or patient involvement. Now here I have this to say that you have to discuss the options with the patient and obviously a patient who has moderate to advanced glaucoma, you have discussed many things with the patient. And you are always going to discuss the success risk versus the complication or failure risk. But all of us, including me, we all have always make decisions on what we want. But what we want is very clear. Everybody wants fantastic vision for throughout their lifetime. That is not a discussion. The discussion has to be on what you want to compromise. Now, this is very difficult. But this is the first statement I make to my patient. We all know what you want. You and I want the same thing. We want good vision to last your lifetime. But what is going to happen if our treatment is not successful is what we need to discuss. And second important thing is surgery versus medicine is not an option. We have to take it as it is medicine with or without surgery. So I never promise a patient that you are going to do the surgery to get away from medicine. Okay, we may be able to get away from some medicines which you can't tolerate, but it is surgery with medicine. So the decision you need to make is whether to continue on maximal medicine or go in for surgery plus or minus medicine again. So next, can we remove that over time thing? 
So then you have to make a decision whether to motivate the patient for surgery or you have to continue. Also, you have to decide at what frequency you will continue to monitor the patient's visual fields and involve the patient more. So I, as coming back to the three points I said, the three points I would like to evaluate is visual function, target pressure, and TCA. And how the patient is doing on each one of these three points will guide me to the decision. So if all three are good, I would be happy to maintain the patient on maximal medical therapy. Any two are okay and one is good, then I would say observe closely. But any two are poor, you would definitely move this patient towards surgery and you need to discuss this more and more with the patient and reach your satisfactory conclusion. So as I would like to say at the end is I hope I have made it a little objective for you to decide what to give in maximal therapy and how to decide when to move this patient from maximal medical therapy towards surgery. And one last point is use SLT. I think somebody mentioned SLT. I don't know one of the previous speakers. And SLT can be used along with medicine as a part of the medical treatment. So I'm not included that here, but it is one treatment which doesn't have any side effects and very good tolerability. So you would definitely use that as one of the modalities. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manish. I think that was wonderfully done because it is never an easy answer. But the truth is, if in front of you, the patient's fields are deteriorating or in front of you, you see that the patient is not using medications because of the allergies or whatever. They really, it is imperative that you operate and the operated, the myth, it is pretty much a myth of the wipeout. So please don't be scared of that. But even better as a general practitioner, if you don't want to operate, that's fine. There are enough people around you especially in institutions who will take that thing. So the, it is indeed even the patient will be extremely grateful if you do refer them. And there are people who don't, like I told you, and when I didn't want to do the surgery, I told them, oh, there's a 2% chance your entire vision will go. But if you actually put it in context, and so one of the patients asked me, sir, but if I don't do, what will happen? Then I said, there will be 100% loss. So when you, once you put 2% with 100%, there is no confusion at all. If there's any confusion, it is in your ability and your bravado to do that thing. And if you feel that you are not good enough, then please refer because these patients have to be saved. And if it is an angle closure glaucoma patients, the earlier you operate or you get them operated, the better it is. So <coughs> Manish, any other points? Ah, nee, nee, so well, like Harsh is going to give his lecture now. So. Yeah, 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 fair enough. So, uh, how did I think of uh, this? The big question was, so all of us are faced with this. So, I actually love speaking in, in Hindi, but uh, unfortunately, there are a number of foreigners also. So, I'll have to stick to English. Uh, <laughs> so, whatever it is, the question, so, so what happened was, you know, how this question came to my mind was, that my one of my mentors and one of the finest glaucoma minds, Dr. G. Chandrasekhar, one day sent a patient to me. Uh, he's in Hyderabad. So he sent it to uh, said, Dr. Hush, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, I sent, please operate uh, my cataract. I said, but you have got a gl advanced glaucoma. Sir, please read what sir has written. So I was really flabbergasted because all our lives we have been taught, but this is something that we have to learn that there's only one thing permanent in life and that is change. So it is, things are going to change the way we are thinking. So, and he said, just do cataract. And he is an advanced glaucoma and I, that made me start thinking, what the hell is happening over here? Have things changed? And that is when I started looking at this thing very, very closely and I gave a thesis to one of my fellows and we really started looking at these things. So why it is becoming greater problem, all of you are facing it. The, there is an elderly population rising, they have cataracts and now we are detecting glaucomas. And once you detect glaucoma, what happens? The problem is you can't do a proper field, you can't check the disc properly because of the cataract. 
you cannot do any OCT like Sunita told you so many times the OCT is such a difficult thing to do especially in these cases it's pretty much tough then uh, and not only that their peripheral vision is gone because of glaucoma the central vision is gone because of cataract and you are wondering what to do should I do only a cataract should I do a combined should I do a trab only so this is what we were really thinking and what when we look back into the literature what is there is that in the initial cataract surgeries obviously it was uh, it was the pressure lowering was not much but since the cataract surgeries have been advanced and I am proud to say that everybody is doing a wonderful cataract surgery. The days are gone when I used to get a complicated cataract and done and something has happened over here. Not at all. Beautiful. So and when you look at that you find that almost 7 to 22 percent lowering is there. There is a there is a medications which can be stopped from almost 50 percent of the patients. And if you look at the practice patterns even in US unfortunately we don't have that design here but so many patients are now undergoing FACO alone and again they have got MIGS now which we have started also but FACO plus uh, the min uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery whatever form and uh, FACO trap has shrunk quite a bit and they actually they, they, they love doing tubes also many times they are teaching tubes before they teach their uh, fellows how to do a trap but not for us for us traps are still primary but see how the patterns are changing and uh, we all know about angle closure glaucoma because one of the causes of angle closure may be the uh, lens vault and you may be having a thicker lens which is creating all this problem so the moment you take the lens out you get a deeper chamber it removes the pupillary block the pressure lowering obviously would depend upon whether there is a trabecular damage over there or not. But otherwise, doing an ACG, a cataract surgery is great, but you have to be very ca careful because you have to be a good surgeon. There is a shallow AC, there is a coronal damage, they already have been on so many medications, zonules may be weak, so and the high IOP very much may be there. And many times when you have very high IOP, and the chambers are shallow, the high IOP you have controlled, but the chambers are shallow. Sometimes you can actually undergo, uh, do a core vitrectomy to deepen out the chambers and make life easier for yourself. As far as the open angle is concerned, we know that the high uh, fluid which is generated over there actually washes off the glycos I mean in glycan deposition. And there are some other biochemical changes, but somehow the other pressure definitely drops. And, uh, and that is what I love about MIGS, you know, when we are doing MIGS with cataract, the patient never actually understand it is because of the cataract or because of the MIGS that the pressure has dropped. So we can always take the benefit that yes, it was because of the MIGS. So if you see the whole uh, story over there in a meta-analysis, yes, almost 7 to 20 percent of the lowering of pressure is there once you do only a cataract. So just to share two simple cases, uh, you know, one obviously the 65 year old female and uh, uh, cataract right eye uh, CCT normal pressure normal the pressure was normal on three medication Brimo Brinzo combination along with Bimato so that is what the patient was taking the pressures are pretty normal the fields were re reasonably okay 79 percent VFI and uh, then obviously we, the patient was very clear that they wanted only cataract surgery and uh, so obviously biomat was stopped timo was started anyway so surgery was taken and you can see the pre-op and the post-op the post-op field obviously will be a slightly better uh, because uh, of the cataract being uh, going away from there there will be an elevation of pressure there was a pressure 30 millimeters then 24 then 20 and gradually six months later the pressure was absolutely normal within two weeks the pressure absolutely settles down and with whatever little extra medications and estazolamide etc. Now this is another case. So in this case left eye 6, 12, 70 year old male, uh, reasonable cataract and the field is 8%, 0 0.9 and the patient is not willing. Nay sir, just do cataract. I don't want glaucoma surgery. Uh, because with glaucoma surgery I have been told there can be a wipeout, there can be this, there can be that, just do cataract surgery. So we explained to him, okay fine, we will do cataract surgery. 
in case there are spikes in case we cannot control so whenever you do something like this tell them in case there are spikes and I cannot uh, control the pressure which happened to me only once in a very close friend of mine 10 days later I operated for TRAB after having done the cataract and later he settled down but this has to be told to the patient that in case things do not settle down okay you want a cataract I am doing a cataract only it merits a combined surgery but I am doing only a cataract provided you stay with me for some time and if the pressures rise beyond a certain limit and we cannot control them that is what we will do so uh, with uh, God's name in our mind we did the care case only cataract this is the pre-op and this is the post-op visual fields so since then i have been really really intrigued and i think this is one topic that we'll discuss with all the panelists and we have luckily dr pandav also here that what exactly do they think about it because my whole approach has changed and uh, so i'm not at all now so scared of doing only a cataract even in advanced glaucoma case provided they are comfortable on their medicines, provided they are well controlled on their medications. Then this is an option after telling them that yes, maybe we'll have to do something else also. So, uh, obviously patients with pre-existing forms of glaucoma are at a greater risk for post-operative IOP spikes. 18 to 45 percent of patients may experience an IOP greater than 28 millimeter. Most pressures will return to normal by 24 hours and I have been following multiple multiple cases touch wood we have never had a drop of field in any of these cases even in like I, what could be more advanced than the case I showed you so uh, the peaks more commonly occur in 8 to 12 hours so that you have to watch them very closely for a few days and uh, almost 10% uh, of cases may record higher than 30 but invariably it drops down so whenever you are doing a surgery in such a case the trick is keep the wound a little on the loser side uh, there's do a extensive wash so that there is no viscoelastic that is the one case which actually elevates the pressure for us so no viscoelastic should be left no lens debris should be left be very very careful and sucking out everything from all around and uh, they should be able to follow up regularly with you so uh, but obviously uh, should cateter surgery be considered a glaucoma surgery no not at all we are very clear about that when we need to do a glaucoma surgery we will do a glaucoma surgery but world over people are more comfortable doing a cataract let them do a cataract let the pressure come down to some extent so that the number of medications will come down conjunctival scarring will be rest uh, the medication burden will be reduced and when we have to do the surgery we will be easier off combined surgeries are more difficult much much more difficult even a busy practitioner is not doing more than one or two or three traps if he is a cataract surgeon so to do a combined is not a joke their failure rate is higher in controlling pressure as compared to a plain trabeculectomy so and there the chances of wipe out this and that all of them are there so only if the pressures are not controlled on medication patient cannot take medication patient is poor in uh, who will not put medication or uh, cannot afford medication and the fields are worsening despite putting medication which seemingly are giving adequate control in all these situation yes we will not do anything else except either a combined or a trabeculectomy. So this is what I wanted to discuss. I think we have, uh, I think we will stick more to this topic later, but let us finish with just one more topic which is there and then we can have the discussion or uh, what is the, how much time do we have Pratip? 20 minutes. No, uh, what is the time now? 30 yeah, we have 20 more minutes. We have 20 minutes. Only 20 more minutes. Achha, then let us, let, uh, we, I'll call Dr. Surbi and she'll talk about uh, hypotonic maculopathy that's another uh, the message in that i think she will give you because we have been dealing with a couple of these cases so let us see what uh, she has to she's my uh, fellow at center for sight new delhi thank you sir good afternoon everyone i am dr sulbi Daneja. i am currently doing my fellowship in glaucoma and cataract services at center for sight new delhi under mentorship of dr Harsh, sir. First, I would like to thank everyone for being here and a sincere thanks to AIOS and Harsha for this amazing opportunity. 
today i'll be talking about hypotony maculopathy and as uh, glaucoma surgeons i'm pretty sure we must have come across hypotony more than once hypotony can actually lead to a very dreadful complication called as maculopathy which usually puts the surgeon in a dilemma as when and how to treat it so let's take the discussion a little forward Hypotony refers to the IOP less than 6.5 mm HG, but there's also something called as the clinically significant hypotony, which refers to the condition where the IOP is low enough to cause the visual loss. Hypotony can occur usually in the early post-operative period within two weeks, or it can occur later as well. The early hypotony, however, is mild, transient, and responds very well to the conservative measures, whereas it is the late hypotony that we need to be a little serious about. Hypotony can be caused by many factors, which I would like you to have a look at. But right now, we will be focusing more on the hypotony, which occurs post-trabiculectomy. It can occur due to an overfiltering bleb, a bleb leak, or due to the underproduction of the aqueous, which could be due to ciliary body shutdown, cyclodialysis, celiocoroidal detachment, or a retinal detachment. It has been seen that with the widespread and the increased use of MMC, the incidence of the maculopathy has increased over time. Here is a video where you can see a bleb leak, a quenching of the uh, dye can be very clearly seen. If hypotony is not addressed, it will lead to maculopathy. The first time maculopathy was described by Della Porta in 1954, and later on the term was given by Gas. The present incidence for maculopathy is 1.3 to 18 percent. But do all the patients with hypotony develop maculopathy? No. There are certain risk factors male sex, high myopia, young age, bleb leak, use of antifibrotic agents, primary filtering surgery. The antifibrotic agents, as the name suggests, they prevent fibrosis and have a tendency for overfiltration, and they can also have a direct toxic effect on the ciliary body. Usually, these patients present with low IOP, chorioretinal folds, optic nerve swelling, vascular torticity, or relative hyperopia. These chorioretinal folds, they appear as dark and light streaks on biomicroscopy, and the cause for them is the uh, scleral wall collapse or shrinkage, which results in redundancy of the retina and choroid and throws it into the folds. The optic disc edema usually occurs due to the anterior bowing of the lamina cribrosa, which compresses the exons and halts the exoplasmic flow. So the uh, low IOP alone will not determine whether a patient will develop mac maculopathy or not. It depends upon the biomechanical properties of sclera mainly, that is the scleral thickness or scleral rigidity. Therefore, those young patients or high myopes, they have thin sclera and low scleral rigidity, and they're more prone to develop the maculopathy. We can uh, do the imaging techniques for the, uh, to see the chorioretinal folds. FFA will help us see even the subtle folds. Uh, B-scan will show us if there is an RD or CD. Uh, UBM, we can see if there is any supracroidal effusion or cyclodialysis. They will help us to rule out any causes for the hypotony. OCT is a wonderful investigation, easily available in ophthalmologist clinic, which help us to see the chorioretinal folds, diagnose maculopathy, and also help us in following up these patients. So now the question of the hour, when does maculopathy develops after hypotony? Well, there is no particular time period. There are case reports where it has developed on third day post uh, the filtering surgery, as well as where it has developed 14 years after hypotony. To prevent the hypotony, intraoperatively, we can, should maintain the chamber depth. And uh, while suturing the scleral flap, the suture should be uh, tied tightly. There's one another thing that Dr. Harsh does in his cases, which are high myopes. We use, uh, uh, we cannot use uh, MMC, as uh, Sunita ma'am said. So in those cases, we use anti-VEGF, and most of our patients are doing well, and none has developed uh, uh, maculopathy. Post-operatively, to prevent hypotony, we should gradually release the sutures or, or do the suture laser, uh, laser suturolysis. Once diagnosed, it has to be treated. Should start with the conservative management and later on we can do the surgical therapy. It provides very good results. If there is a bleb leak, we can give equosuppressants, do pressure patching, use a BCL. There's argon laser conjunctivoplasty which will help us in limiting the overfiltering bleb and we can seal the leak as well. Compression sutures can be applied over the point where there is leak and in case it's an overfiltering bleb, we can apply multiple uh, compression sutures. Conjunctival advancement can be done. Uh, surgical revision actually has the highest success rate, 80 to 95%. Here is a 
here is a video if we have to see the health of the conjunctiva if the conjunctiva is bad then we can remove that conjunctiva and advance a healthy one or we can use a conjunctival autograft then we have to look at the scleral flap if it's over filtering then we can add one or two sutures and uh, if there's a leak or if there is a dehiscence of sclera then we can use a scleral patch graft over it and then uh, do the uh, conjunctival closure this is a OCT of a patient who developed uh, maculopathy and uh, he refused treatment so it became chronic for six months and then we operated this patient and uh, the, as the below you can see there's the post-surgical management OCT. The foveal contour uh, was restored and folds resolved. We did the uh, bleb repair in this case of the chronic maculopathy. So now we know that maculopathy can develop any time after hypotony and also how to treat it. So, uh, but now the question remains that when should I intervene? If you see hypotony is there, definitely as soon as possible and so is the case with maculopathy. What we basically don't want is that the chorioretinal folds should not collease with each other. That is, they should not become permanent and there should not be any scarring. Till then, we, we should always give a treatment trial to the patient. Surgical bleb revision is a very good method, has high success rate and it gives a very good visual recovery. So the crust of this talk I would like to tell is that the conservative measures they work best for the early cases and in those cases where uh, the conservative measures are not working, the resistant cases or where the maculopathy developed late or it has become chronic, in those cases we can do bleb revision as a primary management. It helps in visual recovery as well as it's very good for the patient because it will uh, help in uh, raising the pressures. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Surbi. I think that was wonderfully done. The crux of the matter, as she rightly said, was that uh, I was also sometimes scared by it then hypotony ke and the hypotony has been lasting for now almost a year and they are folds. But the o get an OCT done. If they are, the folds are not attaching to each other, you know, if they are attaching, then you'll need an ERM peeling and all those things will be required. If they are not attaching to each other, just a simple uh, bleb revision will give you wonderful, wonderful results. So that is the message. Yeah, please. So bleb revision in hypo in hypotony, the bleb revision, what it will do is that the area, uh, yeah, you open it up and see what is happening over there. If there is just some a loose area, you can just give one suture, then normally that suffices. If it is a larger area and the inner things are not good, put a scleral patch over it and close it up. The pressure may rise later, but then we will deal with it. The first thing is to get the vision back to normal. Once you get the vision back to normal, you can later do inferior tubes or whatever you want to do. But the patient that time is worried that I came to you for a trap, the patient vision was 6-6, six, six. now my vision is 6-12, I can't see clearly. So the first step is get that hypotony back, get that macula back in action and then we can proceed further. That's what I, that's, that was the crux of the game, that you can even wait for one year. You can, you should not wait, but point is that suppose the patient has come back to you after one year. Do an OCT. If the folds are not attached to each other, that means you can go ahead and do a simple procedure. If the folds have started attaching, you will have to do the upper procedure. Plus, you will have to check with your retina friend that he will do that ER, ERM peeling and uh, clarify that membrane. Really, one month ago. Sorry? Uh, one month ago, I have a patient with lonely eye, just one eye with advanced cupping, 0.9 plus, uncontrolled uh, uh, glaucoma. I did for him uh, Ahmed valve. Follow the surgery, he developed hypotony. Uh, cortisone, madriatic, sweating for him, uh, soft contact, bandage contact lens. Uh, I try something, nothing uh, will develop. Did you suture the uh, valve then? Finally sutured the valve. And the hypotony settled? Uh, uh, still hypotony. Still hypotony. Still but hypotony. if they are choroidal, then you may have to drain them. Sir. Yes, then you'll have to drain it then. Because once you have closed down the valve, but the choroids are still persisting for a longer time despite atropine and everything, then if it is persisting for quite some time, you can give it even a month if they are not kissing choroidals. Not okay? kissing, not kissing. Yeah, then you can wait because I've seen these things sometimes settle back even after one month, two months. So you're... Sorry? 
if not, if this if not then you have to drain. Then you have to drain the choroidal. Then you have to take help of your retina surgeon. He will drain the choroids from outside and uh, push it in fluid inside. Put a anti HMR maintain in the anti H segment and everything settles down. Okay, one of the yes, sir. Chamber was shallow hypotony. I did other eye. Chamber was shallow hypotony. So, uh, uh, as a routine, a routine. A very important message that if one eye had had trouble, anything with any kind of a surgery, whether it's even in a cataract, expect that thing to happen in the other eye also. And it is uh, you, either you can have a valve uh, dysfunction. I opened up the case and I found I injected there in chamber and I, I saw where it was leaking from. And I found that it, there was a little peri peri tube leak, you know. So right, I had to take right. multiple sutures, and finally it formed. So right, right. Uh, yeah. Regarding her case, uh, it could be either a yeah. uh, valve dysfunction or maybe there is a peri tube. Yeah, case. very much so. Uh, so actually, when sometimes when we are actually doing it, and there is a peri tubal leakage, then one has to be really careful at that time itself to either suture the tube properly. So are you using 23 gauge? No, you can just uh, inject fluid also. So even fluid will show you where exactly it is coming from. So another very important, I think we still have time. So uh, Prateep, what do you say for a, uh, a case of advanced glaucoma well controlled and suppose you are in uh, general practice, would you call your friend to do a trabeculotomy along with it and do a combine or would you let uh, that person do only a cataract? Obviously, if the patient has a very advanced glaucoma and on multiple drugs and uh, uh, still uh, the IOP is in uh, high teens, then uh, definitely I would do a triple. But the simple reason is that, that uh, you know, uh, whatsoever low IOP you can get, you should try to get. And anyway, that patient has to use some anti-glaucoma medication in the future as well in spite of doing a triple procedure because you know in these patients your target pressure is pretty low in low teens so it is very difficult to achieve the low teens with a triple if you don't do the triple then the patient again will be at least on maximum medical therapy if you do a triple then probably you can get away with just single drug in these patients uh, sunita I am also a strong proponent of combined surgery, especially the scenario with Dr. Pratik has also explained that the patient is having very advanced glaucoma and he's on multiple medications yeah. uh, and uh, multiple medications and a uh, patient may or may not be compliant with the treatment and if you just do cataract surgery, they are relaxed that you know some surgery has happened and they <laughs> generally become non-compliant with the treatment okay. and uh, as you mentioned in your talk also that there are chances of having post-operative spikes, spikes which can be disastrous to the health of the optic now especially if the patient is having very that advanced glaucoma. So if you are just doing cataract surgery, be very, very vigilant and measure the intraocular pressure regularly post-operatively every second or third day just to, you know, uh, take care of that spike. But otherwise, if it is very advanced glaucoma, I would also like to do a combined surgery in yeah. such cases. The only problem is that in the periphery and for most of our uh, practitioners, doing a combined is a very tricky procedure. So, but like rightly Sunita and Prateep both emphasize that in case you cannot do it, you have to be very, very vigilant and you have to be uh, follow up the patient very, very regularly. And in case they, uh, they drop out over there, you, they will, you will have to tell them that uh, please go ahead and get a trial. Yes, sir. So in the uh, only eye, he's having a, a field loss, a sort of a superior uh, field loss, arcuate loss, and he's on multiple drugs. Pressure is around 14, 15, and this is a cataract. And he also already had a glaucoma as the first line of treatment. I had done that. Mm -hmm. But he's saying that his vision is deteriorating. And uh, so what should be the next uh, way out? Like I have already added uh, you know, rock inhibitor for him also. 
so all the medications yeah so if so many medications are going on i think it will be preferable if you have a conjunctiva which is free and mobile in the superior fornix and uh, the first trap has worked for at least 3 4 years then you can surely go ahead do another retrap on the sides and uh, now if the patient's vision can wait do only a trap because traps alone are much more successful than actually combines but if the patient is not ready to wait then you will have to do a combined and if you feel that there is no place upstairs then definitely we'll have to do an inferior valve then either you can do it or refer it because since it's a one right patient there will be no great shakes <laughs> vision is okay, deteriorating because of the uh, progression of cataract yeah, or because of the dry well, yeah. eye or because of the glaucoma progression as well. yeah that so can never be clear yeah. because once you have uh, a cataract you just don't know which way yeah. it is progressing but we'll take it that it could be either so i was thinking whether to do a cataract and then again assess the fields yeah and, and that is a possibility if the patient does not agree at all okay but the way you are saying and so many medications are added possibly one can do either a trab alone or you can actually even do a like like i showed you here some cases one can possibly do theoretically we may not be very correct in doing it but yes it works so you can try that and let the patient be ready that if things do not uh, fall into place then we may have to do a trab pretty soon i would suggest that in your patient you do the same subject objective analysis which i told you if the drugs he is using is he tolerating well not so well very bad is his visual function stable or is it progressive means his visual field if he is tolerating whichever drugs he is using quite well and complying to it and his visual field is stable i would be very happy to do only a cataract surgery any other question please or are we done yeah please sir sir uh, i have a patient and i have been following her uh, for about more than 15 years now this patient is on uh, she is uh, having chronic renal failure and she is on uh, regular dialysis now she has developed cataract also and she has advanced glaucoma although controlled the uh, ablation tension is almost almost 12 10 like that well controlled now shall i go ahead with the cataract surgery only or combined surgery yeah i think that's what i showed that i have i i've now actually i was very very scared of doing these things but now i've learned that yes you can sh- definitely go ahead giving her all those caveats that yes. in case things spin out of control let me do a c- trap surgery right immediately afterwards yeah i think okay. patient with chronic disease no i have i have had uh, very good results with combined surgeries no yeah, fair enough so, so if if you if you are comfortable combine then go ahead and with, do a combine yes can absolutely I use, can i use mitomycin c in such cases yeah it's not a high myope you can go ahead and that's what uh, my fellow told you that we have done now many many cases which we actually published so in case the patient is a high myope you are not good in using collagen which many of us are not then you can actually uh, do an anti vegf at the end of the surgery inject the same amount of anti vegf that our retina surgeons inject inside okay once you have finished the surgery put it into the bleb it is doing exactly the same thing for you which the mito is doing it is anti fibrotic it is preventing uh, the fibroblast from coming in it is uh, decreasing the vasculature over there so i have done it in multiple one eyed patients who had high myopia and was scared of doing anything else and the they have done this patient is in my Uh, no no so in this case you can just do a standard this thing but i'm just telling because that point came up and one more thing sir the patient is on regular dialysis yeah, she has so to, she has to undergo dialysis dialysis at least i think three times yeah. a week no 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 that is a very uh, important thing uh-huh. if the patient is on dialysis then the anti vgf are even the mitomycin c you you check with your nephrologist and if they give permission then only use it and their blood is very thin so be careful they have a tendency of developing hemorrhagic choroidals following the trabeculectomy so can we do only cataract yeah sir. because patient i think it sir. may be preferable yeah. to do only a cataract and, and since the pressures are well controlled on medication no what uh, her nephrologist had told that uh, hyperin uh, the next time when she does mm. undergoes this uh, uh, dialysis they would not use hyperin probably no that's fair but point is if you are doing a topical cataract you really don't need anything at all so you wouldn't be having any uh, injectables or anything else 
So I think go ahead and do a cataract in that. Actually, she wanted to get rid of all these topics uh, <laughs> medicines also. No, no, no. <laughs> and what will the companies do who are sponsoring us? <laughs> so same thing again. Yes. All patients want to get rid of their medications. It is not, it is, nobody says, no, no, I want to put medicine. <laughs> so this is not a valid argument. Yeah. Every patient wants to be rid of medicine. Every patient wants to reduce the number of medicine. So this is not the argument which we should ever use. Uh, other factors which we have discussed, please concentrate on those. All patients, are, every patient of mine wants to discontinue medicine if possible. So that is not a given thing. I also want to discontinue that. <laughs> thank you, sir. Chalo, thank you very much. I think we had a wonderful session and a lot of interaction. Thank you, all my uh, co-authors. Thank you so much.